Okay, welcome to Rock Docs, a podcast about music documentaries. I'm David Lizerbram. The other voice you will soon hear is my co-host, Andrew Keats. Uh, you can find out more about us uh, or participate in the conversation on Twitter, at Rock Docs Pod, and Instagram the same, etc. Um, okay, so what you're going to hear is part two of our Rank the Rock Docs um, post-season two. Uh, basically, up to this point, we've now reviewed 20 different music documentaries, and we wanted to rank them uh, from 20 to 1. We each did our own rankings, and then you can hear us compare them live and agree, or in many cases argue about those rankings. Um, So yeah, so uh, it went a little long. So last week's episode was part one, where we did obviously numbers 20 through 11. Uh, Feel free to go back and listen to that. And what you are about to hear is part two, where we go from 10 to 1. So I'm about to throw you right into that. Uh, Thanks for checking it out. And uh, yeah, let us know what you think about the rankings and so forth uh, on uh, the old internet. Thanks a lot. And here is Part two of Ranking the Rock Docs. Uh, number 10. I, f- I feel like uh, we're, we're sort of on the watch of like where I'm going to, to, to drop some of these ones that you had rated much lower. Um, but we're not there yet. I have number 10, Genius. Okay. Um, which, look, I... I think genius is a like a like a a remarkable movie. I I real I think that watching that movie over three weeks was one of the more enjoyable things I've done in the streaming era. I am still mesmerized by some of the footage they have. I think it's unparalleled in basically everything short of Get Back that we have here. Um, I do think that the on on further reflection the third episode doesn't fully deliver on the promise of the first two and i'll say that there's a little bit of a spawn con element that drags it down a little bit that i I think everybody was too close to kanye to give him the complete critical distance that that the film might have benefited from and maybe let him off the hook a little bit because he's 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 been, he's been more than a bit erratic and and i think if you watch the movie the idea would would maybe just be that he's he's a sort of erratic guy who's dealing with some troubles and i think maybe more than that has happened and so uh i love this movie i will certainly watch the first two episodes uh dozens and dozens of times in the remainder of my life on earth <laughs> Um, I probably won't revisit the third episode all that often. Um, but I think that given even just a couple weeks distance, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm chunking it down just a little bit from where I was a little bit ago. Okay. I got that one higher. So we'll get back to that for number 10. I have a uh, Billy Eilish. The world's a little blurry. Uh, and this one I have so much affection for that. I really could have, this one could have jumped like five points for me yeah. uh on a yeah. on another day um and it was like painful at this point to get to get this low um I, her relationship with her parents is so amazing uh and i loved it so much uh and when I, recently i was watching the oscars um other things happened than what you heard about during the oscars and one of which was that uh billy and phineas performed their song uh from the james bond movie and then they won the oscar and when they cut to her to go they cut to them uh, winning the Oscar, her mom was there, and I was like, "Oh my god, that's Billy Eilish's mom. Where's her dad?" Like for whatever reason, her dad wasn't there. I don't know. He was whatever. He didn't get a ticket. Yeah. Whatever. Um, he had something else to do. Um, but uh, it was like seeing those beloved characters again that you know that yeah, I enjoyed yeah. so much. And um, we also have the uh, the first uh, Rock Docs appearance uh, of beloved uh, Rock Docs character actor Justin Bieber. <laughs> Anytime yes, he pops absolutely. up, uh, you know, it's like he's bringing a positive vibes. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, just I, I, you know, I don't know. I would definitely watch this one again. I, 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 I loved it. Um, number nine. Here it is. Here it is. People. Bittersweet Motel. Okay. Sneaking into the top I ten. Can't, I can't bring myself to bring it above anything above it here this is as high as i can go i've never been more proud of you (laughs) this is i i pushed i pushed the limit i absolutely went as high as i could go look i just um 
I've watched Bittersweet Motel like four times since we did an episode on it when you just trashed it the whole time. And, you know, it's 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 just April. Like, I'm sure I'll watch it six more times before the end of this year. All right. Like, and that being the case, I just I would be lying to myself. It would be a lie to our listeners. It would be a lie to you as my friend and co-host. It would be a lie to myself if I didn't put it at least this high. This movie, I, look, first things first, the most important thing, we've got primo pro shot footage of fish in 1997 and 1998, the absolute peak of their powers. I, I'm sorry, I can't, I, I, I can't discount that. I can't look past it. I can't, um, I can't weigh Todd Phillips' bizarre creative decisions more than that. This movie has given me something that is very valuable to me. And so I must credit it for that. Um, second of all, like the, and I mentioned this a bit in our season one wrap up show is I concede that this movie does not have a, an arc, that there is no beginning, middle, and end to this movie. And I also concede that Todd Phillips had interests that were like far more than his interest in fish or any story about them or making a movie about them. He wanted to make a movie about the lot kids. He wanted a movie about other stuff. That's all true. However, like episodically there is stuff in here that I think is really interesting. Trey talking, uh, reading a bad review and talking about how he handles bad reviews is like compelling, interesting, uh, sincere footage. Trey talking about, like living in the shadow of the Grateful Dead and the way he understands and conceptualizes what fish is, what fish isn't, what Grateful Dead was, what Grateful Dead wasn't, and how they're different and how little he thinks about that band in, res in respect to his compared to how much everybody else thinks about that band in respect to his. I think that's like fundamental stuff in understanding Trey Anastasio and, and fish and like understanding Trey Anastasio and fish is like a big part of my life. So I can't, I can't, I can't, I just can't write that stuff out of the narrative. And so I'm sorry, this, that's where this movie goes for me. I'm just uh, happy. It wasn't like two or three. So <laughs> okay. I consider I that a victory. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. And I'm sorry. And I appreciate you letting me have that moment no. to, to, to rewrite where bittersweet motel belongs because it's a fantastic movie and fish is a great rock band. And that's all I have to say about it. Okay, so for number nine, uh, for number nine, I have Tom Petty running down a dream. Okay, um, wow, interesting. Uh, you know, again, not a knock to be at number nine in this uh, fine company. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's everything you want. It's great, you know, four hours of Tom Petty. Uh, you got uh, the Roger McGuinn infamous uh, scenario. You've got just lots of great stuff in it. Um, it really delivers on what you expect. Um, I'm not sure that it, you know, exceeds or over delivers that. Um, it is like the Tom Petty of rock dogs, which is like Tom Petty is great. Um, in my opinion, he's not, you know, he, he's not touching the like real inner circle of greatness. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, you're Bob Dylan's and so on. And everybody can argue about who else is in that, you know, that list. Yeah. Um, but um, that's not a knock to say like, you know, he's not like Charlie Parker or something. I mean, again, like that's fine. I think he was very happy uh, with the place that he, you know, arrived at as a, you know, superstar, incredibly talented, successful, beloved, uh, you know, commercially, critically, all those things. Um, a guy that I've listened to my whole life um, and I, I'll enjoy watching this movie again and again. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's other ones that I, you know, for whatever reason, struck me a little bit more. Yeah, it's it's like I said. I quoted my friend Pete in uh, in our episode that he argues that uh, Tom Petty's music for everybody. That's that's like this documentary. Yeah, so he's he's not any he's not everyone's favorite. There's other people who are more controversial that have higher highs or lower lows, but Tom Petty is just like. No one's out there saying they hate Tom Petty. Yeah. And likewise, no one no one else is watching Running Down a Dream being like, that movie sucked. Right. You know? It's not happening. Yeah. Number eight. Festival Express. Okay. That's where I that's where I come in on Festival Express. Okay. Again, 
Uh, I feel like I've already more or less said it, but I'll just say again, this is another movie that I've seen a billion times previously, and I'll see a billion times in the future. And uh, the archival footage is just incredible, just absolutely top-notch. The tour story is absolutely top-notch. The bros hanging on the train, can't beat it. And uh, it's a great document. It's a great document. It's also, it's, it's also, you know, it, I, I think it's a bit of a legend now because the movie's nearly twenty years old. But like uh, the the Festival Express tour was not something that was in common parlance back in uh, two thousand before this movie came out. So um, I was glad that it it elevated this very unique, interesting, maybe even I would venture to say important thing that happened in nineteen seventy. Okay, um, for number eight, I have Dig, um, which again, you know, some people consider the greatest rock doc of all time. So mm-hmm. it, it kind of seems like a slam, maybe that I have it as number eight. I don't, I don't mean it that way. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, everything we said about it, I will reiterate. I love this movie; it's great. I'm sure we'll uh, talk about it more when you get to it. Um, and uh, it's an awesome movie, but uh, these are all awesome. So yeah, there you go. All right, great. Number seven. Summer of Soul. Okay. Uh, Oscar Award winner. I'm happy happy for you, Questlove. Um, that was certainly the most notable thing that happened in that hour of the telecast that evening. Yeah, other than Billie Eilish's, Eilish's mom appearing on. Other yeah. than Billie Eilish's mom. Um, I think, you know, so so my point about the Festival Express sort of re-elevating this thing that maybe was not especially high-profile prior to the movie's release that's far more true about summer of soul than it was true of festival express no questions asked and a far more important thing to elevate to its proper status um it was well done and i think most importantly it like launched the career of quest love the rock doc filmmaker who i think is about to go on a run that i'm really excited to see of him telling the story of American music that other people have been unwilling or uninterested or unable to tell. Um, and so I sort of see this as like, like a reservoir dogs moment for rock dogs. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, we, you and me are going to be riding his coattails for years to come. (laughs) If we can keep this, (laughs) dumb podcast going um we're just every by writing you cut co- this his coattails you mean receiving no dollars <laughs> yes. and o- occasionally racking up bad reviews on apple i that's yeah that's um yeah i've set the bar pretty low but yeah, yeah. um yeah. no no doubt about it uh I'll, mine's coming up soon S- summer soul's coming up soon for me but i've got uh zappa at number seven um much higher than you ranked it uh kind of like a uh, bittersweet motel i'll be honest that zappa is kind of my guy or one of my guys Mm -hmm. uh and uh always loved his music um i will perfectly agree with you that um if i have a complaint about the movie it's that alex winter the director almost seems afraid of zappa's music being off-putting or too weird or goofy for people or or it might be that it's like it's too complicated and um and it's daunting to try to be a music critic about, which I hear myself stumbling over just discussing it, that it, it, it's hard to talk about because it's so complex, it's so demanding. And so maybe he was worried about it in that way or something. I don't know, but there just wasn't much of it. Maybe. I mean, but I will say that one thing that you surprisingly said that was insightful um, in yeah. that podcast episode, which stuck with me, is just like when you're at the end, you're like, you know, just like it's don't be stressed out about Frank Zappa's music. Just put it on. It's good music. Like, you know, like it, 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 you know, it's, um, it's not supposed, you you don't have to like understand his music theory, whatever bullshit. Like it doesn't matter. Like, you know, whether it's Frank Zappa or Captain Beefheart or whatever, or music that people think is like intimidating or, um, you know, only for people that have, you know, really understand certain things about music. That's all nonsense to me. Um, yeah. and you kind of encapsulated that a little bit. So I appreciate that. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I ranked this movie really high because I, um, first of all, just, there is so much love and affection in this movie, which is something that I just really enjoy and is not easily found at what you would expect from the story of Frank Zappa. It's such a twist 
to have that emotional content um, and such a unique perspective and a way to get and a way to bring people to be engaged in his story. Um, there's just a lot of craft in the movie in terms of like mm-hmm. just there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, and the mm-hmm. way that the story is told, um, it, you know, is really interesting to me. Um, and yeah, so I think it, you know, to me, this movie exceeded my expectations. I was like, Alex Winters directing a movie about Frank Zappa. Great. That's going to be super cool. I'm really interested. But you also hope that doesn't suck, especially when it's somebody that you really like. And it's somebody that, uh, you know, there's not going to be 10 million Frank Zappa documentaries coming out. You know, it's not like the Beatles or something. So, um, yeah. yeah, I just love this one. Um, all right. Number six. Beats, Rhymes, and Life. Okay. Story of Getting into the good West. stuff. This yeah, this was this was where you know an episode where we you and I were were really effusive. We were really geeking out about how much we liked the movie and the guys and the music. Um, and I still do another movie I've I've watched a handful of times since our episode, and I still love it as much as I did at the time. I I do I will say that one thing that has stood out to me a little bit more than it did when we recorded our episode is like the case against. Q-tip, mm. I, like I, I remember sort of during the episode being like, I'm a little bit confused about why so many folks are so hard on Q-tip in the the Q-tip five dog feud, and I gather that a lot of people seem to think that he was he was cruel and uh, unconcerned with five dogs health problems, and. I guess I do see a little bit more of that than I gave it credit for in the in the first watch, um, but that's all a, a detour to say that this movie is absolutely top tier stuff. This is why I'm into Rock Docs. This the music is highlighted completely. If you go into it with only a cursory knowledge of the band, you're going to come out wanting more. In all the best ways, you're going to get a sampling of all of their best stuff. Um, the personalities come through, the story of them and how they fit in with hip hop culture and how they advanced hip hop culture uh, is well told. Michael Rappaport does a great job. There's some fantastic fly on the wall footage of them during their concert where things were falling apart and some of the reunion stuff at the end. It it really runs the gamut of what we want out of a movie, and I can't speak highly enough about it. No doubt, I've got it even higher. So, um, okay. you know, uh, that's um, you know, there's there's no doubt. So that was your number six. Is that right? Am I getting this right? Five, five, number five. Okay, so I think I skipped one. Okay, so num- for my number six, do we miss one? For my number six, I have uh, Summer of Soul. Okay. Okay. My number seven was Zappa. What was your number seven? Let's get this straight. With this, Summer of Soul was the one we did not have from you. Okay, yeah. So your seven was... Let's correct it. Let's make sure we're on track here. Festival Express. Okay, so my number seven was Zappa. Your number six was... Festival Express. No, your number seven or six? <laughs> oh, I, I missed... Uh, you know what I missed before uh, Festival Express? Uh, I missed... I'm sorry. Uh, before Beats, Rhymes, and Life, I had Velvet Underground. Okay, so which number was Velvet Underground for you? Six? Six. Okay, now yeah. now we're clear. Okay. You yeah, want to... Yeah. I apologize. All right. Yeah. We've, you've said your piece about Beats, Rhymes, and Life. We'll hold up. We'll, yeah. we'll, you know, we've got that, but yeah. Velvet Underground yeah. hit me with Velvet uh, Underground. So Vel- Velvet Underground is just like a, a full <laughs> sensory experience. It, it is like like the, the the scene in Clockwork Orange with the eyelids. Yeah, open. sure. It is um, a it it is a unique approach to making a movie uh, like this, visually, uh, especially and 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 sonically, really in a lot of ways, which is fitting because of what the Velvet Underground were, and I'm sure that was intentional, and uh, it works really well. Um, I think if you care about the Velvet Underground's music, if you care about Lou Reed's music, if you care about the early avant guard art scene i think if you care about the early 60s rock scene i think there's just going to be untold bounty in this film for you it um is a fantastic introduction to the music of the velvet underground which 
Oddly enough, I still run into a lot of people who have never dived in yet, and I would say that it is, in, for, in my opinion, incredibly accessible. As we were just talking about with Frank Zappa, don't be too worried about it. Just dive in and listen to it. It's great stuff. You're going to like it. And this movie is a good example of that. And as odd as this movie would like to paint them as, as, as like how outside the mainstream what they were doing was, um, and I have no doubt that that's true, uh, they just come across as an interesting and important band. And Mo Tucker absolutely jumps out of the screen. Oh, yeah. As like a Rock Docs Hall of Famer. Yeah. Absolute Rock Docs Hall of Famer. And Lou Reed's sister. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So. Two, two, two great performance, two great rock doc performances there. Um, I, I, I have it above Summer of Soul, which you know they both came out last year. Summer of Soul just won an Oscar. Velvet Underground was not nominated. Uh, no, I guess it would. Did, did Velvet Underground? It was like was on it, a short Velvet list or something, even, but it wasn't nom- It wasn't nominated for best documentary. Yeah, um, and so uh, you know, certainly the the esteemed members of the Academy disagree with us here. And that I, I think there's something to to their their ranking. To me, the Velvet Underground visually was just so different and so startling, um, like to the point that I had like had to pause it a few times just because it was it was such a re- remarkable and overwhelming experience. Whereas uh, Summer of Soul was a little bit more straightforward. Yeah, um, went down a little easier. It went down a little easier, and so uh, that that's what makes the difference to me. But I, th- I think both of them are, frankly, all-timers. And I, I can't believe that we got both of those last year. Yeah. Um, okay, so that was your number six, to be clear. My number six is Summer yeah. of Soul. Um, just repeating everything you said, you know, it's uh, phenomenal. It's great. We loved it. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, again, we're, we're fighting for that top spot here. So, um, you know, but mm-hmm. uh, no doubt one that I can't wait okay. to, you know, to watch again. Um, so your number five then is Beats, Rhymes, and Life. Beats, Rhymes, okay. and Life, So I'm getting yes. that clear. Okay, so Beats, Rhymes, and Life, you've got it number five. Uh, yeah. I have Genius at number five. Um, oh, wow, okay. A bit higher than you. Um, I yeah. think I rate the third part of Genius higher, and mm-hmm. this might be a situation where a year from now I'm going to regret having this one so high. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe it's a recency bias. Um, because it just kind of came out and we all went on this ride for three weeks um, watching it unfold on Netflix. You know, that, I guess, is separate and apart from the movie itself, but I can't separate it. You know, that's like the way you experience a movie is part of the deal, right? So just like you caught on with Festival Express, you know, 20 years ago and have been enjoying it ever since, and I just checked it out a few weeks ago, um, you know, the 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 drama uh, of this whether it was even going to come out, hey, they've got this crazy movie that they've been yeah. filming for 20 years about Kanye. It just was so Kanye. It was so right for the character that, yeah. um, you know, that part of it uh, is valuable to me. And it's somebody, you know, checking it out 20 years from now, that might mean nothing to them. But, you know, for me, in my experience, that's really part of it. We also have now the second appearance of uh, Rock Doc's favorite, Justin Bieber. And, yes, uh, yes, you know, yes, of yes. course, bringing just good stuff, good, good quality stuff to the pot, to the, uh, Can we, do we, do we have a request in with his people about an interview? Uh, yeah. We, um, he's thinking we, about we, it. We do have um, okay. we haven't, we have not heard back. Yeah, no. Um, no. Um, in fact, they call right. security. Well, so, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's get the, the rock docs universe out there, you know, yeah. at, at, at Bieber and let him know that you'd love to hear him on our program. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. We would talk to him. Uh, yeah, of course, please. People seem to there's pe- there's a, a definitely class of people who seem to hate this guy, and I don't get it. I don't I don't understand. No, I don't get it. But n- now that that said, and I'm not saying that they're right, but like I don't pay attention to like a lot of stuff. Right, I don't either. And so like for for all I know, he he's done jerky things, or he's done eye rolly things, or he's done uh cringy things. I don't know what other. That's like true for most of the people on this list, though, right? <laughs> most of the rock stars <laughs> yeah, of or people we're talking about have done horrible things, if not cringy. So, yeah, except, you know, yeah. except Mavis Staples, who's a saint. <laughs> except for Mavis Staples, frankly. Yeah, who never yeah. put her foot wrong in her entire life. And, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah, except, uh, like, as risque as things got was her smooching with Bob Dylan. All right. <laughs> uh, so, number five, genius. Uh, number four, Andrew Keats. Running down a dream. Okay. This is uh, way up lo- there for you. Well, I, I love it. I love it. 
uh, very much. This is like, frankly, to me, like this is the this is the rock doc archetype. This is what I want. Like, I want you to go long. Go ahead, four hours. As long as you got the goods, I'm here for it. Mm-hmm. I got. I'm in no hurry. Yeah. This is my kids are asleep, and this is how I'm spending my time. I'm I'm here for you. Uh, as long as you got the goods, you just got to keep <laughs> delivering. And this movie keeps delivering. It's got great early stories of Petty's life. It's got revealing interviews and interesting anecdotes from people I care about in the history of rock and roll all throughout. Yeah. Like from from the from the earliest part of his life, from when he's in like high school. Yeah. You're hearing or when you're in childhood, you like footage of Elvis. Yeah. You know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. his whole life, you you're getting a, a story of American music. Yeah. Through Tom Petty's life. Um, he's involved in it all. He's a good storyteller. He's an interesting guy. He's a, a, a jokester. He's uh, funny. Um, every member of the band all, delivers goods. Every single member of the so band rare. delivers goods. Yes, yes, absolutely. And like when they have something that doesn't need to be there, they're not they're not afraid to just be like, "It's fine. Let's just live in this for a little bit, even if it's a weird fight that Tom Petty." took on with Roger McGuinn's uh, producer in for his 1990 comeback album. Right. Um, and, and, you know, and then to say nothing of the absolute stellar moment where the, the traveling Wilburys come together, which could be its own documentary, uh, which the wildflower section, which is its own documentary that came out yeah. later. I mean, like it's, it's a movie that all of this, rewards the four hours that they gave it it's expertly produced it teaches me a lot about a lot of people that i like to learn about whether it's stevie nicks or jimmy Iovine or tom petty or eddie vetter or uh, um whoever else right you know there's 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 a half dozen people that you learn a lot about in this movie sure. and uh it's not showy it doesn't have a a, a high premise it's not a high concept movie um, it's just a very well done, straightforward, great rock and rock. rock and All right, uh, number four, I have Beats, Rhymes, and Life, uh, a Michael Rappaport joint. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, you know, this one uh, ranks really high, not just because it's an expertly put together documentary, and not just because all the music is great. Um, mm-hmm. Just every single beat every every beat and rhyme <laughs> is great um yeah but it gives uh, you life yes but um i mean all four of these guys i love um but there probably is not one person that i have as much affection for in the entire rock doc catalog as uh five dog and um yeah. i love in a way i love that it was made while he was still alive i mean they didn't know that he wasn't going to live much longer you know they knew that he had health problems but you know it wasn't like you know he was gonna be gone any day now um, so like watching this movie, and it's not like the Levon documentary where he's like staring down his life. No, no, either. he was still a young man. And, um, you know, so in that way, like watching the movie, it's like, he's still alive. You know, it's like, he's still yeah. with us, um, because he was yeah. at the time. And, um, yeah, I'm, I don't know. It's just, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a killer. It's great. Um, yeah. All right. Number three. Now we're really getting there. Rolling Thunder review. Okay. For me. Uh, I almost feel like you're angry at me for only putting it. Number, no, I'm surprised three. you ranked it so high. I thought you were going to go low with this one, and we were going to argue. Oh no, no, no! I lo- no. Are you kidding me? This is crazy. This is like Bob Dylan. Uh, like, look, I know you, you Joker men folks like to really, really revel in the 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 late '80s, the the mid '90s, the the early 2000s. Sure. For me, this is this is the the best Dylan era. I I this is the height of dylan to me if i could even more than like 66 this is like the dylan i would like to listen to is the rolling thunder review shows and um th- i mean the 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 footage is just so damn incredible the live footage is maybe the best live concert footage we get in these 20 movies i think um there's a lot of dylan tricksterism there's a lot of like things that are impossible to explain to somebody who isn't steeped in Dylanism about like why certain things are happening. 
And that's not to say anything about the absolute bizarro world decisions that Scorsese made to fictionalize certain parts of this movie, which I think maybe came across as like highly critical from me in our first episode. It's mostly just that I don't understand them, but I am <laughs> amused by but but I am amused by them. And uh, so when I watch now, I mostly just sit there with a, a goofy smile on my face because I find them very amusing, even if I, it's beyond me to like derive meaning from them. Yeah. Uh, my top three are a game time decision. Um, Cause just, okay. you know, any moment could be any of the three, okay. but right sure. now, Fair enough. Uh, my number three of the three remaining that I have are, uh, is velvet underground. Um, okay. I mean, it is so good. <laughs> um, yeah. I love the Velvet Underground. I love their music. I love Lou Reed. There are things about this movie that you could say, like, well, they only really focus on the first like two albums, and the rest of their careers completely glossed over. In fact, the Velvet Underground doesn't even show up till like forty five minutes into a two hour movie. <laughs> That's insane. Um, if you don't, if you're not particularly interested in the minutia of the mid sixties New York art scene, it may seem like this movie has no reason to exist and is a like egomaniacal <laughs> excuse for the filmmaker to just get into weird stuff that he's into. Uh, I like it when filmmakers get weird um, and yeah. try something different and don't just like, you know, go for singles and doubles, which is fine. Um, but I, you know, Todd Haynes just really went for it with this one. I, I think it's visually fascinating and compelling um, and a great um, companion to uh, the Velvet Underground's music and their story. I think the fact that they he was faced with the dilemma of having barely any live footage of the Velvet Underground, like there just is not filmed live footage of them performing with sync sound that like exists barely, uh, and having to make a movie without that thing that is like the number one thing that we go to these movies for, <laughs> and still, you know, just knock it out of the park and do something that is so wild and compelling and crazy. Great is, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, man, it's awesome. Uh, your number two, Andrew Keats. My number two is dig okay. with an exclamation mark. Sure. Um, so my, uh, exposure to the, the, the two bands included in this movie, Brian Jones, Hummer's massacre and the dandy Warhols was, practically nil prior to this movie I, I knew both of them only a little bit uh after seeing it i still don't particularly care for the dandy warhol's music maybe a little bit uh brian johnson massacre i would now call myself a fan of and this movie i think is a masterpiece i think this movie is absolutely incredible it is has footage that's just unparalleled like I getting not and not because of who they became later and you get this it, it like becomes retroactively interesting like, because like they the become movie. so famous like the Kanye movie it's just incredible because of what's happening and they happen to have a camera rolling period you know yeah. if 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 Brian Jones and Massacre never happened to ever produce a single album let alone a popular one it would still be incredible footage um, it's well put together. It uh, is of its moment, and frankly, I I think Anton's take that like he deserves some credit or some acknowledgement of being sort of a bridge between the Pearl Jam era and like the the Strokes era. It's like kind of holds up pretty well. I think like I think they were they were in trying to make this happen in a late nineties period when rock was in a, was in a dip. And, um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I think that, that, uh, as, as far as pictures of, uh, a genuinely interesting person that deserves this sort of treatment go and delivering on that premise go, you really couldn't do better than this. And, I think it almost is elevated more by the fact that these aren't people who I'm already fascinated by, that I'm already drawn to learning as much as I can about that. Um, you know, frankly, I'll concede that Festival Express and Bittersweet Motel, the primary draws for them are just seeing people who I already love 
doing playing great music there's no like inherent draw of this movie except that it's just a really well done movie um and so i i feel compelled to to uh, give it the credit that i think that it has earned all right uh number two and again game time decision um uh, and i'm not gonna throw the curveball here uh i'm going with rolling thunder review uh a bob dylan story by martin scorsese uh and um yeah i mean you've just got the greatest performances of all time uh captured on film in this incredible footage by the greatest musician (laughs) there and person like a creative person that ever walked the earth <laughs> practically and the, and the greatest director of all time yeah too, and maybe, martin scorsese you know? yeah uh it, you know kind of comes in and and shapes it um and makes weird choices um and like i said i like it when they go weird um you know if you're a you know an up-and-coming documentarian um you know you want to go weird because you want to make your name that's great you want to climb our rankings yeah you sure no rankings? but i'm saying like if you're kind of uh you know on the way up and you want to just try things because you've got nothing to lose that's one thing um if you're martin scorsese uh, making a documentary about bob dylan in 2019 or whatever um you know you uh, uh, you just can mail it in and um put together footage of this tour and stick your name on it and call it a day and cash the paycheck and everybody will love you and it will probably be on its own great um but the fact that he just goes out there and goes full bob dylan with it um he's i mean he i think he's got that joker man mindset you know what i mean like he's he yeah, gets yeah, yeah, yeah. he gets the weirdness and the uh you know the, the the value of trying weird things and just going in a different direction that everybody you know that everybody expects um you know the 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 physical grain of the footage is beautiful. Just everything about it is um, so stunning. And um, I like the weird stuff that everybody hates. So whatever. Um, it's great. Um, I want to, I just want to clarify, cause I've gotten some notes about this is I didn't hate the, the odd decisions. I just, th- they've broken me a little. Okay. I just don't know. I just don't know what he was doing right. and I'd like to, um, but I am content to just write them off as, as Scorsese doing Dylan. Right. I mean, listen to the lyrics of Desolation Row or something. I mean, it's yeah. not, you know, straightforward. Like, okay, I get it. Yeah, sure. Boy falls yeah, in love with yeah, girl. Sure. You know, I mean, it's just like, you know, the guy's out there. And, um, you know, it's not intended to... It, it's not supposed to fit a, a conventional narrative. It just doesn't... It yeah. wouldn't be right. All right. Uh, well, there's now... We've now left ourselves with no drama or suspense. We have the same answer for number one. Uh, that would be uh, Bittersweet Motel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Get back. Make your pitch, Andy. I, I just, I can't believe that we, for all of our faults. <laughs> Which are many, uh, manifest. Have, get to get to live in a world where this exists. Yeah. I mean, what, what? What did we do? Why? Why would we? Why would anyone give us this? Why would this happen? <laughs> I don't. I don't deserve this. There's nothing about this film. There's nothing about this footage. There's nothing about the technological achievement that Peter Jackson uh, made possible to deliver it. There's nothing about the canny, you know, critical de- or, uh, creative decisions to keep any sort of contemporaneous talking heads out of it. There's nothing about any of that that fits what i expect out of my life i have been conditioned to to anticipate some bad things happening <laughs> yep and the release of get back last year doesn't fit into that narrative it was such a beautiful thing we're close to <laughs> and it really was i really like i really feel blessed I well feel like I, when when religious people finally said that i finally was like Wow, do they feel like this all the time? Well, this is the first time I felt that way, fun- and I have two children. <laughs> it's funny you say that because I we're close to the time of Passover, uh, okay. the Jewish holiday, <laughs> as we record this. And in yeah. Passover, there's something that we say, which is "Dainu," which means it would have been enough. So there's this like thing that you repeat, and it's like a song, where it's like if you had just um, you know gotten us out of Egypt, it's the story, Passover, you tell the story of the Jews escaping from bondage in Egypt and you have the 10 plagues and crossing the Red Sea and then um, you know finding the, 
the Ten Commandments, the Torah, um, at Mount Sinai. So it's like at each stage of this, it's like it would have been all you had to do was get us out of Egypt. It would have been enough. And then to, you know, to to get us across the Red Sea, that would have been enough. And then to feed us with manna from heaven, that would have been enough. Dainu, Dainu, Dainu. Like, and then to lead us to Mount Sinai, Dainu, that would have been enough. And then to, you know, all these, you know, great blessings that keep happening one after the other after the other. And I feel like yeah. Everything we had from the Beatles up till this movie came out, Dainu. That would that would have been enough. Like yeah. it's enough. Our like, you know, we can't even ask for more. And then yeah. this comes out, and it's like eight hours Dainu. long. Dainu. Yeah. I feel yeah. like yes, exactly. Yes, all those years of Hebrew school have finally trained yeah. me to uh, recognize a you know something a blessing from heaven when it arrives. And right. that's right. Um, I don't know. Maybe we're overrating this movie. And uh, second episode rolls around and there's a h- h- hidden microphone in Paul and John's conversation. Dianu. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> Billy like Preston shows up. Dianu, you know, Bill, exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. I mean, Ringo, Ringo makes a fart joke. Dianu. Like, <laughs> like, like Peter Sellers shows like, up. What did I do to deserve like, all this? My God. I feel like yes. 2000 years from now, people may be, yeah. you know, watching this movie like we read the Passover Haggadah. <laughs> <laughs> like my people I think, I think, and this dude, will be their religious text and they will keep just, saying billy preston dianu thank god he's not, something else looking at each other you like know. like footage from the top of the of, from the rooftop concert dianu and then you yes. see the cops show up yeah um, yeah it's one thing absolutely. after the other um i mm-hmm. just it's filled with so much love ringo alone is worth watching eight hours of this movie um but uh all four of them uh, all four of them, I, I swear, I feel like as, as the time has passed, the period of like picking sides has has aged poorly. And my take that all four of them come out looking roses has aged really well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, John, it's a little rough at the start. Um, he's pretty strung out. But he, to- he, but he, but he, he rises he, to he, the occasion. He, yeah, he, he lands the kickflip, you know. <laughs> he's, 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 you'll <laughs> find that uh, I work best when I'm on a deadline. <laughs> Yes, exactly. In fact, he does. And in um, fact, he does. That's yeah. Right. I mean, if there's anything better in the uh, that we are yet to discover in the Rock Docs canon, then uh, you know, Paul writing "Get Dana. Back." <laughs> if yeah, if there's something better to be found uh, to be unearthed by some future documentarian than Paul writing "Get Back" and 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 and, and George and Ringo just watching it happen, kind of dumbfounded. Uh, I I look forward to seeing it, but. If not, yeah. if we never get anything better than that, Dainu. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Oh, my mother uh, would be so proud. That's all I got to say about it. Yes, <laughs> she's gonna, she's gonna love this. I'm, I'm so happy for oh, you that mom. That, I hope that, you that your mom gets to hear one. this. Um, okay, <laughs> so um, there you go. The definitive ranking. In a few seasons, we'll do this again and argue <laughs> all over again, and it'll all in, probably immediately as soon as we stop recording. Regret my choices, uh, which is yeah. true about a lot of these podcasts. So there you go. That's fair enough. Yeah. Anyway, there you go. That's the ranking. Anything else, Andy? Right. No, that's all I got for you. Okay. So enjoy our uh, further musings at Rock Docs Pod and Twitter and Instagram and stuff and uh, so forth. And there you go, Rock Docs. <laughs>